This podcast is brought to you by Vinzero. Vinzero pioneers solutions and services to the AEC and manufacturing industries to support net zero targets. Visit Vinzero.com to learn more about how organizations design, build and solve through digitalization. From Vinzero to you, welcome to our Think Future podcast series. Each week we'll share conversations with industry leaders from around the world to find out how they're thinking future. Subscribe to Vinzero Think Future for access to more episodes, interviews and profiles. Dean de Cruz is a graduate in architecture and a partner and principal architect in Mosaic, a leading design firm based in Goa, involved in urban intervention, architecture, conservation, product and graphic design. Dean is actively involved in professional practice as well as in academics and has conducted numerous workshops and seminars on architecture, planning and the environment across India as well as abroad. Dean's work and articles have been published in leading magazines around the world and he supported the Royal Institute of Art, Stockholm Oxford Brookes University UK and Pratt Institute New York for their architectural and planning programs in Goa. At Mosaic, Dean strives to provide holistic solutions to its patrons. Mosaic explores prospects of symbiotic growth of their clients with nature, encourages sustainable practices in their design And Dean joins us today to talk about design for the future. Welcome to the program, Dean. Hi, great to be here. Dean, can you tell us, first of all, what inspired you to study architecture? Architecture was quite by chance, actually, as a profession. I mean, my dad was an engineer, and uh, it almost felt that I had to become an engineer as well. I came upon it quite by chance, but I realized it was was right up my street. Uh, When I look back at my career scores in school, which you have this assessment uh, I scored like an 80 in science and 80 in arts. And, and the first recommendation was architecture. Yeah, this was after I joined the architecture college and I looked back at it. And I, I was really lucky enough to find a course that, you know, was really meant for me. And as I went along, it really is, I discovered it in a way, you know, so it's, I lived it in a way. I mean, through college, it was a great experience, you know, because an institution can only give you so much. It, when you really live architecture, it it opens up so much more for you. So I, I'm really happy I, I chose it. When uh, I graduated in architecture, and even during during my years uh, studying architecture, it was those brave new years of you know architecture in India. So it, it was this uh, you know we're we're a young country. We have to sort of create an identity of our own. And uh, but modernism was really you know a driving force in the architecture of India. So it's we. A lot of the buildings at that time were these uh, buildings that attempted to to keep up with the Western world, as they say. So you could see a lot of experimental things. We had Corbusier, uh, who had done some buildings here, Khan, who had done some buildings here. And uh, those were the inspirations for the early architecture. So stalwarts like Bibi Doshi and Charles Creer were modernists. Those were big influences for students of architecture and even you know architectural practice at that time. What we see happening here today is, is interestingly different because uh, you can see that our architects are now constantly trying to be different from the rest of you know rest of the world, rest of Asia. There's a lot of experimental work taking place and uh, a consciousness to to do an architecture that's appropriate to India, which is it's nice to see. How is the architecture in India evolving based on today's needs? India is really going through a challenging time at the moment. I mean. We have a shortage of affordable housing. At the same time, we have a price rise in architecture. People are paying, you know, generations of income, you know, just to buy a single house in a lot of cities. Developers control the market. Architects have a very small role, actually, in the architectural game because developers really call the shots. It's really interesting how certain architects are actually addressing this in a way. I mean, there are people who've done... uh, studies on, say, traditional forms of a low-cost architecture. If you look at Bombay, for example, there's the Chol model, which is this one-room tenements, uh, you know, stacked together in these really compact uh, housing complexes uh, around a central courtyard. And even though the privacy levels uh, were really, you know, poor on that thing, people just almost look at the other person's house, it was great community. I mean, in these buildings, uh, which were generally looked down upon, uh, because they were not very, you know, well-to-do people. They came from different parts of India, had different cultures, different religions, and yet it was a cohesive sort of settlement that came together. They celebrated each other's festivals, uh, and India is transitioning from this, you know, joint family system to a nuclear family. 
So you, these peoples were the first nuclear families. Yeah, they moved from their villages to their joint families. They come into cities that you know this is the only thing they could afford. So they really had to reach out to each other to help each other. And and the architecture sort of helped in that way. It was just you know by chance that it it was really dense and it had corridors around. So the corridors began the public space. You know they had a little room. And uh, that courtyard also became that uh, central space for the community. So, as Indians, I think we, uh, our privacy levels are, are are generally very low in terms. You know, we don't mind people you know, sort of dropping at any time, and you know, there's not much of uh, that barrier. So, I think it's 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 a great opportunity to actually take advantage of that informality in the architecture we design. Uh. So, Dean, what does sustainable architecture mean to you? Well, about 40 years ago, when we first started practice, uh, we used to build in a low-cost style of architecture, not because we wanted to necessarily, but it was the only way as a young architect to actually you know, come into the market. I mean, people would come to you and say, can you design a building for us? And you know, how much would it cost? And we'd say, we, we can do it for less. You know? We can make an architecture which is you know, cost less, and yet at the same time, perform much better than most other conventional pieces of architecture. So we we'd use low-cost materials, recycled materials. It's only 20 years later when the word sustainable came about that we realized that we were doing sustainable architecture we, we, because it was low-cost, we are recycling stuff. So when I look at sustainability, it's, it's really about being low-cost. It's about being sensible about things, sensitive to issues. So oh, we, we work with a craft-based architecture. We try to recall building systems, you know, we trained masons over the years. We are called you know, building systems in masonry and wood and steel. So we were contributing to sustainability because sustainability is, is not just about you know materials and technology. It's, it's also about livelihoods. So how do you provide livelihoods, especially in a country like ours, where you know labor that's available is plenty, and, and of course we're losing the the craft base. So so here was an opportunity to actually allow for livelihoods to be um, supported, and that's sustainable. Uh, allow for resources which are closest and materials which are you know available in the village. Uh, and uh, if you look at traditional systems, they're, they're also easy to uh, access and you know understand and, and work with. Uh, so if we just do undertake these very simple sort of uh, methodologies, uh, we've achieved sustainability. And uh, it's no big deal because uh, unfortunately today sustainability has made this very complex thing. You have these green rating systems and, you know, green leaves. So you get five green leaves if it if it's fulfills these, ticks these boxes. Uh, whereas I think an architecture which is just sensible, you know, it has to have a, really a, a clear understanding of what the issues are. Uh, when I worked on a building in, in Noida, it's close to Delhi, we worked on a prefab building system where we were looking at a thin wall system where the two options were natural stone uh, as a cladding or a vitrified tile. Common sense tells you that, you know, yes, natural stone is much better. It has less embodied energy, it's less resource usage. But we visited quarries in the area and uh, we found that there's uh, an immense amount of pollution, uh, water usage, and even the worst is human rights violation. With all these workers working over there, virtually slave labor. They're taking loans and they just had to work there under pittance of wages. Whereas, say, the vitrified tile, which came from a factory, uh, pollution was taken care of properly, uh, the workers had a fair wage. So it was really far better in that sense. Even though the embodied energy was more, uh, it made more, far more sense to actually use this industrial material versus the natural material. So that's about being sensible about these issues and sensitive as well, that, you know, we don't have to go by a rating system. We just have to see what's appropriate for that particular project or a particular material or technology that we use. Use it judiciously. So we cannot use these uh, ready-made formats of systems and say, okay, fine, if I do all these, you know, fulfill all these points, it's a sustainable building. So how would you redefine architecture based on that change in societal needs now? I think really but we need an architecture that's, uh, that can afford to be denser. Right now, the solutions for, say, you know, low-cost housing is multi-storied. So you have in Bombay, for example, uh, what they call the slum redevelopment schemes, which are these 10-story buildings, 10 feet apart. They're replacing the, the very slums that are around Bombay. So you have uh, Dharavi, for example, which is Asia's biggest slum. And uh, But these buildings are a disaster uh, from a health point of view, from a social um, 
point of view, the levels of uh, tuberculosis is 400 times the average, national average, because there's, there's no proper light ventilation. So as architects, we need to really look at, is this the correct model? How do we go? Is it, it can it be high density and low rise? Can we create you know proper light ventilation, sanitation uh, for these people at a low cost? Uh, and there's some interesting solutions actually coming out from that. Uh, and it's a question of just implementation. So I think it's, if architects can influence policy change, that would really make a big difference. So, and the way we can do it is actually by creating some really sort of aspirational presentations. I mean, now with the softwares today, you know, everything can really be jazzed up to a level where you know the politicians sort of uh, look with interest at it. So I think if we can do that and, and make it attractive for them, we can bring about that policy change uh, to the political system to make the right decisions. And you just touched on some of the interesting solutions that you're seeing today in India when it comes to architecture. So can you share some of the innovations you're seeing in that regard? So the people like uh, architect Samik Padora, for example, who's actually uh, now who heads the the SEP school in Ahmedabad. Uh, so he's done a very interesting study on you know, the chores in Bombay and other low-cost housing and come up with uh, done research work on you know what are the possible solutions using that model there's Bibi Doshi who's done it in some of his housing projects. Charles has done it in some of his housing projects in New Bombay. Uh, so the number of solutions, you know, all over. Uh, Laurie Baker has done it in in Kerala. So we have a lot of uh, possibilities, you know, depending on you know, the region, the, the cultural influences of the area, of uh, really great solutions. Uh, unfortunately, it really needs uh, you know political patronage to be able to implement them. So I think it's it's a challenge to really you know, push these uh, projects through. So when it comes to driving change for a better built environment, what role do you see architects playing? So maybe I think uh, the role as an architect, I mean, I mentioned the regional plan uh, in passing, so that you know, even though I'm not a trained planner, I, I sort of took part in preparing the new regional plan for Goa. And, and it was a great experience because you're, you're creating architecture at a totally different level. You know, you're, it's not just about building, you're creating a complete environment of, of communities uh, coming together. You're creating these communities that integrate with, with uh, you know, all the natural resources. Uh, so I think architects really need to move out of their comfort zone uh, because they have the ability to actually uh, intervene in so many other areas. So the ability to actually communicate with people, uh, to convince people, you know, of what really is the way out? Uh, the architectural education is, is so broad based that you know you, you've got an overview of you know what's happening in terms of you know, the environment, uh, the economics of things, you know the, the governance systems, uh, and the actual implementation and building. So, I think it's if we can get more architects to actually uh, become good citizens, I would say, uh, I think we could see a big difference. And and just of course, it just doesn't mean architects; it's it's everybody really to be conscious and and participative in policy making, you know, so that uh, we can really bring about the change that's needed. Because the crisis that is upon us right now is we don't really realize how bad it is till it, it really hits us and it'll be too late. So the sooner we really, you know, take it on board and deal with it, I think the uh, better it is. Uh. So how do you get that political patronage to support the requirements for change? So a lot of institutions, for example, the IIA, which is the Indian Institute of Architects, the uh, uh, IIID, which is the Indian Institute for Design, Interior Designers, are actually creating these outreach programs as sort of uh, part of their CSR. And they're doing these uh, proposals pro bono and putting it forward as presentations to the government saying that, you know, why don't you try this? And a few of these have actually have been implemented, especially in the area of, you know, urban interventions, you know, streetscape, a few housing projects here and there in terms of turning it around. Uh, so I think it's 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 slowly happening. It needs it needs to be moved much faster, but there's hope at least. Uh. Are you seeing an increased requirement or an increased focus on CSR based initiatives in design? There is a little, but not enough. CSR money is mainly going into the the healthcare, the educational sector. It's not going to architecture where it could really help. Uh. That's really the brick and mortar of even education and healthcare. So, can you do something which will really create the framework for you know, the various social social areas, arenas that you want to work with? Uh, uh, for example, in in Delhi, uh, 
the Amadmi Party, which is a fairly young party, created this model of uh, what they call a Mohalla clinic, which is basically a very small clinic rather than have these district hospitals, which are you know uh, far to reach. And you know, a person who doesn't have the means really has to spend half a day going to the hospital, and he forfeits his earning for the day. These clinics virtually come to them. Uh, they're small prefab units, uh, which actually can be placed in any little open space. They don't require any building permission. They're fairly low cost. Uh, in fact, a friend of mine actually worked on the design, and uh, it was the first time that these designs were actually made. So there was no PW regulations in terms of what the materials used. So they actually created the model. Uh, they, they costed it out and said, okay, fine, this model costs 30 lakhs. Uh, they tended it out uh, for 500 units, and the cost came down to 15 lakhs you know, per unit because it was, it was mass produced. And uh, so it was just an amazing exercise in actually uh, bringing this new architectural model into the into the urban scape, and uh, you know it's it's really made a difference to people's lives, especially the lower section of society of uh, services coming to them to their doorstep virtually. And you just mentioned they're being manufactured for mass production. Are you seeing any trends in design for manufacture and disassembly and assembly? There's great potential taking place. I think the materials of, of prefab are now of much better in quality. So in the old days, a lot of prefab materials didn't join properly. They didn't last very long, so they really got a bad name. But now the quality of prefab units are, is much better. The, you know, the design aspects are really well taken care of. And uh, the great advantage is really the speed of construction. If you take the actual cost of a prefab unit versus a conventional sort of architecture, it more or less works out to, to the same. But because of your speed of construction, that means your return on investment, uh, the time taken to actually implement what you're planning uh, is much less, it's actually quite cost effective. So I see a lot of that happening and wherever it's appropriate. Uh, we ourselves have also you know, gotten in a small way into doing prefab uh, structures uh, where we if we're working in eco-sensitive areas, of course, mainly in the jungles or in uh, coastal areas uh, uh, where we say that you know, we can build this and we can take it away and it doesn't impact the environment, but also in urban areas. So you can see these prefab structures coming up on the terraces of buildings and the open space. You know, So it's definitely catching on and uh, it's made a big difference. So. And certainly your region is affected by climatic conditions and scarcity of resources. So with water circularity top of mind for World Green Building Council at the moment, the COP28 this year, what's happening in India when it comes to design for circularity of the city's water system? So water is a big challenge, so, because most cities, I mean, across the world as well, tap water resources from well beyond the city, I mean, because they're from lakes or rivers, uh, which are quite distant away. And that actually saps... Uh, resources from local area where it's, you know, villages up that area. And the city's water needs are constantly increasing because the number of units are coming because of uh, the water needs. Uh, in Goa, for example, uh, when we had the traditional well, people to, to draw water, you know, with a pulley and little, you know, sort of uh, vessel called Goso over here. And uh, so the volume of water that used was 200 liters in a day. But the moment they started putting pumps in the place, you know, because you just pump up any amount of water you needed, here you had to actually physically struggle to take the water out. That went up by five to ten times, yes. So it's the conveniences that have really also, you know, put a pressure on uh, the thing. So it's, without thinking, you, you flush, without thinking, you just, you know, shower to any length you want to. So I think there's a consciousness is, is coming about that we need to use less water, but uh, it's not soon enough. And I think we're going to face this, a fairly serious water crisis in the future is in our cities because uh, they're all really stretched. And uh, another factor is really uh, the climate change uh, factor that's, that's taking place. Uh, so a lot of these, our cities are going below uh, sea level. I mean, you look at Bombay, the, the scenario is really quite scary. What's going to happen, say, by 2050? And that's going to affect uh, a lot of the service infrastructure of, you know, water supply lines, sewage lines, power lines, uh, so it's, it's definitely going to affect water in terms of the clean water and uh, how it's going to be distributed through the cities. So how does a country like India start to prepare for those sorts of catastrophic predictions? I think one is to actually tame the urbanisation that's taking place. 
India is now about 35% uh, urban. The US is 85% urban. But we do not have the technologies uh, at hand at the moment to actually uh, go further. The government goal is to make India 50% urban, 50% uh, rural in the next, say, 10, 15 years, which to me can be quite a disaster. And the reason why people are moving to cities is because the conveniences, I mean, you know, sort of maybe better schooling, better facilities, services at the marketplaces, or accessibility to uh, any other amenities. So what we're trying to push to say that, you know, why don't you actually uh, get these amenities to tier two and tier three cities uh, rather than allow them to come into uh, denser sort of urban areas uh, and put pressure on, you know, the infrastructure of, of big cities. So if you make these, you know, smaller cities and towns uh, attractive, they will not need to move because the people who move into cities really don't identify with the cities. There's there's always this little house kept in the village when they retire to go back to. So they're not they don't really feel that they belong to these cities. Uh, so I think it's important that we we try and you know keep the human factor in mind when we design these cities. And uh, so yes, there may be people you know uh, young families that may identify with the cities and continue living to them, but a good majority of them actually want to go back to their hometowns. And, and this has been, you know, studied, uh, you know, by a lot of organizations and they realize that uh, cities are, are not aspirational from actually a perspective of, you know, looking into the future and, you know, as a retirement place. So they only come there because of the conveniences that it has and they don't really feel that they the cities are, are a good place to live in. And especially when you look at the toxicity that uh, the cities are now, the, the pollution levels and uh, a number of other issues that are taking place, there's a great deal of social strife that's taking place in cities with the sort of uh, political systems that tend to divide communities. You know, you can see the tensions that take place in cities, whereas in their traditional places, the demography of the places is fairly even, so they're able to actually you know build communities a lot easier. So I think it's, it's, it's important that, you know, the government, looks at supporting uh, rural areas, uh, providing enough density that they can have the conveniences, it really it really is much more efficient because then you don't need to centralize, you know, water systems and power systems. All these remain distributed. In fact, the, the real solution for India is decentralization. You know, and in our strive, you know, as a new as a new country, we thought, you know, we must centralize everything, must control everything. But uh, you know, as Gandhiji says, you know, the future of India lies in our villages, uh, and which is so true, you know, today especially because our villages have really been the model for development, you know, because they have uh, in a village people have a sense of identity that they have because they've, they've grown up there, they've, they've, their forefathers have been from there. There's a strong cultural bondage that that takes place in these in these villages, uh, and these villages can be made you know, uh, industrial in a way, but it's a soft, sort of soft industrialization. So uh, industries which are really sensitive to a lot of the ecological factors, industries which are craft-based. So I think that needs to be really developed and encouraged. Unfortunately, we've taken the industrial model, which is like big industries where, you know, and make workers out of craftspeople. Uh, we need to really, you know, actually reverse that trend and, you know, get back the craft into India. We have a major unemployment uh, uh, issue in India. So a lot of what we do needs to be, you know, labor intensive to actually make use and, and provide employment for these uh, for these people. And not just meaningless employment, employment which really uses their minds and hands in a positive way. Are you looking for a digitalization and net zero partner to help you achieve your goals? Join the thousands of AEC and manufacturing customers globally who have turned to VinZero to start their journey toward a net zero future. With 32 offices around the world, VinZero can connect you to the right technologies and workflow processes, so you can maintain your competitive position and increase profitability. VinZero has an industry expert to help you navigate the best pathway forward, wherever you are on your digitalization and net zero journey. Visit VinZero.com to find out more. So you've mentioned a few times there the political landscape and, and regulation and policy. What is the role for regulation and policy in driving the mindset change required to to rethink urbanisation? It can be driven from a number of aspects. One is, of course, resources. I mean, 
if they just do a number crunching on you know what is the investment needed to say provide so much more water so much more power to cities you look at congestion issues look at what they're spending to create metros to try and mitigate the problems of transport within cities if they just do that simple number crunch and they realize that they're spending so much on all these infrastructures just to make the city not attractive just livable you know which is just the basic uh, sort of livability in it and yet it's a struggle for people in cities uh, whereas the investment needed say in a rural area would be far far less uh, because it already has the natural infrastructure to live a good life here uh, and the aspirations are not that much you don't need to provide playgrounds and stuff. And other things they don't only really exist. Their fields are their playgrounds. You know, their their hills are their playgrounds. So all these uh, these infrastructures which we otherwise struggle to provide in the city are already exist uh, in these villages. And also, if, if you're looking at sustainability, I mean, sustainability is is having all your resources at close proximity. Cities don't have their resources at close proximity. I mean, food is imported from you know, hundreds of kilometers away. Water comes from hundred. Power comes from far away. And all that uh, besides, you know. Putting in those resources, it means maintaining those resources. So, whereas in villages you're you're able to provide all these resources, you know, at close at hand. When I visit Costa Rica, for example, Costa Rica has done a really interesting job of of actually decentralizing their infrastructure. So their their power systems, their water systems are actually fragmented into these various districts. So, so there are no big dams. There are small check dams that actually provide water. Power stations are uh, also decentralized. So all these are, are fragmented, and then you have local population um, you know, taking care of it, because centralization means one response, of course, you know, the whole governance issue which comes in, which is, you know, it means a lot more money to try and centralize everything, control everything, whereas decentralization also, you know, provides a sort of federal system and a democratic system of actually deciding uh, where their future lies and how they would like to take it, uh, uh, and also provides a robust uh, political system. The moment you centralize. You know, it's it's just a one party system that just comes in and controls everything. Whereas here with a federal system, you can you can actually have that debate, the dialogue, the opposition, and the the di- the discussion that takes place, which which makes it a vibrant society. So, do you see an opportunity to uh, drive the built environment towards that decentralization model in the near term, or where are you seeing the pathway in the next, say, twenty years for India? I think now, uh, I mean, you see states slowly putting their foot down, and especially with the government that is uh, at the moment uh, quite arrogant. S- states are coming together and saying, we can't take this anymore. We, we need a say in, in our future. And uh, so that's a really good sign to take place. The states are trying to innovate on a lot of their policies, which are you know, set in the past. For example, uh, the support for, you know, uh, equality of women coming up uh, in terms of, you know, payment, you see support for uh, a craft uh, taking place, recognize that craft is an essential part of India, whereas, you know, say 20 years earlier, it was all about industrialization. We need big factories. And uh, so all this is slowly taking place. And uh, thanks to really not the government, but uh, through a lot of NGOs that, have, that uh, are working on the ground and uh, at grassroots level and bring about these changes uh, these NGOs, of course, in the recent past have, um, since they've challenged a lot of uh, the current dis- dispensation that we have, um, they've been, you know, sort of taken to task for it. But I think the people now have realized that you know, they need to really uh, push for this and, uh, you know, bring about that change, which is, is really good to see. Do you have any examples of aspirational developments or projects that are being undertaken in India currently that perhaps are exposing that vision that you have for a more sustainable built environment or a more decentralized built environment? There are various organizations. That, I mean, uh, if you look at uh, Oroville, for example, which is this experimental community in uh, South India, uh, there's the Baker Center, which is uh, uh, also in, in Gedala, also in South India. They're actually you know, showing possibilities of what could be done in terms of uh, how you know architecture can can uh, change people's lives, how uh, proper planning can make a difference. Uh, so I think it's, there is uh, hope. It's it's still much less than, you know, what is really needed to bring about sufficient change. Um, but I think if 
if we're able to actually address uh, the issue of uh, bringing in political collaboration, uh, it can be done uh, fairly quickly. So I think if you look at, say, climate change, that could be a great driver because suddenly people are being, uh, becoming aware of uh, the effects. I mean, food resources are being challenged uh, at the moment. And it's farmers, uh, as you may know, I mean, their crops are extremely vulnerable to um, disasters at the moment. So they're realizing that they have to now look at alternatives in terms of planning their futures. And it can only come from from good planning exercises, which, uh, uh, and that's why, you know, when uh, when we worked on the regional plan for Goa, we uh, we felt that, you know, planning is not just about uh, the typical development issues of, you know, industrialization and, you know, economic growth. Uh. So, Dean, you're talking a lot about the role of villages in creating a better built environment. What role do you think eco-villages play in teaching us about a better future? Yeah, if you define what what's an eco village, I think an eco village is is one that is autonomous in nature, uh, one which uh, produces all the food it needs, uh, harvests all the water it needs, uh, sequesters sequesters all the carbon dioxide, uh, and uh, takes care of its own waste. Uh, so if we can achieve that and also create livelihoods, you know, within the village framework, uh, villages also need to, you know, trade with other villages. So what is the trade? You know, if you look at into the past centuries ago, I mean, every village actually was independent, but yet they had to to get other resources from other villages. They had to have some form of export and uh, for the imports into the village. So we can actually go back to that really old model and, and recreate. Because right now, villages have become dormitory towns. Yeah? You know, cities have become this central you know, buzz of the economy, and villages have lost that importance. And and villages are really the cells of development. If you look at you know, any state, it's it's like this creature, which, you know, a village is, is this independent cell which needs to communicate with all the other cells to really create one you know, homogeneous living body. So I think that if we can actually uh, re-empower villages to, uh, and make them, you know, eco in a way, uh, I think that really serves uh, in the long run to be, you know, the right model to go by. It certainly is. So when you think future about architecture in India, what is it that excites you the most? I mean, the fact that new technologies are emerging, the fact that we have young people who are really concerned about the environment. I mean, not just architects, but uh, small fields. My, my daughter's a, a marine scientist. She struggles with trying to understand you know, why the world is so insensitive to, to uh, ecological issues. But she still you know, believes there's hope. Yeah. And I think we can actually give that sense of hope uh, to young people uh, they will move on. Yeah. I mean, she was part of a group that actually challenged the government that were putting in three major linear projects in Goa, which was uh, uh, the double tracking of a train uh, line, the widening of a highway, and uh, massive new transmission lines that ran through dense forest area sanctuaries. And these youngsters came together, they fought a campaign, went right up to the Supreme Court and got these projects stalled. Yeah. Uh, and now that area has been declared as a tiger sanctuary. These are just people with with very little experience in in the realities. I mean, at my age, I would have been far more cynical and said, you know, we can't really fight this. Uh, but they were brave enough, maybe in their naiveness, you know, also, you know, devoid of uh, the fear of uh, being being stopped in their endeavor. So I think that's that hope and that sort of drive, uh, if we see in youngsters. Um, being implemented today, being with there, there's definitely no matter how big the challenge is, I think that's a great hope. So you mentioned some of the challenges you faced with the project in Goa. Would you say that was your most challenging project to date? Yeah, it it was a challenge because it was a great learning for me. I, I worked on the regional plan for about four years. You're dealing as with a scale which is you know so so big. I mean that you're playing God in a way. Because you're you're really now going to shape the lives of people by the policies you set, by the demarcation of the lands that you preserve or the lands that you allow for development. Uh, uh, you're dealing with you know the, f- the food resources that you're actually putting out in the future. So you really have to be sensitive to all these issues. You have to wear a number of hats. You know you have to wear the hat of of the activist and say that you know we do not want this. You have to wear the hat of the developer and say that 
yes, we need this development, you know, for the place because the economy is a driver. You're wearing the hat of the communicator. How do you actually communicate these ideas, you know, to the people, to politicians? Uh, it was quite a challenge to actually wear that, but a, a great learning experience. Dean, thank you for exploring the potential for architecture to change people's lives, and we wish you all the best in political collaboration required to support and change the mindset towards urbanisation and planning for a better built environment in India. Thank you. Thank you for this. This podcast was brought to you by VinZero. VinZero helped the AEC and manufacturing industries keep pace with digital change and achieve their technological and sustainability leadership goals. VinZero is a company that cares about creating and building a better world. Together, we are working with industry and environmental experts, providing forums and platforms through our VinZero Think community to create conversations that matter to our future generations. We invite you to join in the conversation and participate in our Think community. Like and subscribe to Think Future to stay up to date with the latest innovations and conversations as we take AEC and manufacturing around the world closer to zero. You can download our podcast at binzero.com or from your favourite podcast platform. From Vinzero Think Future, thanks for listening.